Good evening, good yom tov, l'chaim. Nice to meet you all. My name is Levi Margolin. I'm originally from Norfolk, Virginia. So my parents are both from Brooklyn, so I may speak too fast. If I'm speaking too fast, just let me know. Uh, I've tried practicing uh, going slower, but it's not always so simple. <laughs> um, Norfolk, Virginia, and I moved here in the summer of 2012. Um, I married a girl from Jerusalem. And for my day job, I am the director of the Mayan Oak Birthright Program. Uh, we bring several thousand students to Israel every year from college campuses across the United States with our partners on Chabana campus. And uh, that's what I do. In my spare time, I like to volunteer with Chabana Chavia and other organizations. And I like to uh, study Torah sometimes. And tonight I'm going to share some of that with you. So I was always taught by my teachers that it's important to start with a joke. My jokes, a joke. So there was this woman on a train, and she walks up to this guy and says to this guy, excuse me, sir, are you Jewish? And he says, no, I am not Jewish. And she's, she walks away and she sits back down. She comes back to the guy like five minutes later, hey, excuse me, sir, I know you said you're not Jewish, but tell me, are you Jewish? No, I'm not Jewish. And this keeps happening five, six times. Eventually she comes to the guy and says, listen, I got to know. Tell me the truth. Are you Jewish? And he says, okay, finally. He says, you know what? You got me. I was trying to hide. But I'm Jewish. Yes, I am. And she says, funny, you don't look Jewish. <laughs> of course, uh, we're coming up into the holiday of Hanukkah, which is next week. And it's a, if you're on the streets of New York or Los Angeles or Miami and even here in Jerusalem and Tel Aviv, it's a question you hear often from young Chabad students and Chabad shluchim and rabbis. Excuse me, are you Jewish? Did you light the Hanukkah candles? So we're going to go in to talk a little bit about the Hasidic perspective of Hanukkah, what it's all about, what is the deeper meaning, where does it come from, and why. I'd like to start with a, I started with a joke. I'd like to continue with a Hanukkah story. Some of you may have heard of Rabbi Moshe Brisky, Chabad of uh, Agora Hills in California. Rabbi Moshe Brisky has a famous story that he tells. Uh, many years ago, when he was still pretty new in his neighborhood, um, he was outside of his home one day, and, he, and uh, a man is moving in next door. Him and his young daughter are moving into the home next door. And he walks over and he introduces himself. Obviously, excuse me, sir, are you Jewish? Oh, yes, I, I, am. I happen to be Jewish. Oh, well, nice to see you. I'd like to invite you to my house for, for the Shabbos meal. And the young man, well, the middle-aged man, says, you know what? We'll come for a Shabbos meal. It's just me and my daughter. And uh, he says to the rabbi, you know, this is interesting because I asked God on my way here today with the movers to send me a sign that this is the right choice. And God sent me you within moments of my arrival. I didn't expect him to be so aggressive about his uh, letting me know that it's the right move. But now I feel comfortable about this. And he starts coming to Chabad. He starts coming to Shabbos meals and services and holidays. He starts coming to a class. And the, cl the class is titled <coughs> Faith and Suffering. And he starts to learn about the Hasidic perspective and the Jewish perspective on faith and suffering and how to still believe even if you've been through tragedy and uh, unfortunate events. And the rabbi noticed that during the class this man would cry a lot. And he wasn't sure why. Eventually he decided he needs to find out. So he asked this man, what, what is it about this class that, that, that is affecting you? And he says, Rabbi, I need to tell you a story. A number of years ago, before we moved to this neighborhood, in my old neighborhood, even before my last neighborhood, before that, um, I was living in a, in a home, we had a family, my wife, my three children, and two of my children were, were taken from me in, a, un, un, in an unfortunate car accident. And he starts to tell the rabbi that his life was very affected, his marriage then fell apart, and he says, you're talking about faith and suffering, this is me, and this is something that I've been through, and I really have been affected by these classes, at a certain point in my life, after that tragedy, I thought to myself that maybe it's better if I just take my own life. And he said, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through with it. But I'm going to take my daughter, the one surviving child, on a final night. Obviously not tell her, but we're going to go out for a night. She wanted to go to the movies. And they chose a movie theater in Simi Valley um, at the Mountain Gate Mall. And they went to the movie there. And on their way out of the movie, they see a bunch of Hasidic men and rabbis and families and children, a uh, small crowd, but dancing around a menorah that was just freshly lit. Live candles and a couple of Chabad rabbis and a few others standing around this menorah, uh, dancing. And excuse me, sir, are you Jewish? Yes, I'm Jewish. And he brings them in and the daughter is dancing with the kids. And 
They're standing there and they're dancing. And he thought to himself during that, that he can see that there could still be a life of light and a life of joy. And he turned around his decision and he came home and he decided that he's going to move to a new neighborhood and start over. He went to a new neighborhood, eventually he came to this neighborhood and this is where he found the rabbi. And the rabbi hears this story, Rabbi Brisky hears this story and he says, whoa, hold on one second, just wait here. And he goes back into his office and he pulls out a photo album and he comes and he opens the album and he says, was this the menorah lighting you were at at the Mountain Gate Mall? Hmm. And the guy <coughs> says, yeah. And the rabbi says, that was my first event that I ever did as a Chabad Shliach, before wow. I even moved here to Agora Hills. Wow. And I had called up the operator back then, before, before uh, the internet and before knowing everything, called up the operator and asked for the local mall. And she said, which mall? I said, I don't know, give me a mall. And he, the operator transferred him to the Mountain Gate Mall. And he says, I want to put up a menorah and do a Hanukkah party at the mall. And the, and the person that answered the phone says, are you sure you want to come to this mall? Yeah, it's better than no one. Hey, if you'll take me, I'll do it. So he came there uh, the day before to set up the menorah, and he realizes why the woman was shocked that he wanted this mall. The mall had was surrounded by uh, tractors and construction uh, vehicles and construction trucks, and the mall was going to be demolished just a few weeks later. But he figured, you know what, let's make lemonade out of lemons. He's going to go through with it anyways. The only thing in the mall that was open was this cinema, this movie theater. So that night he came there with a couple of other Chabad Bachram, him and his wife and his own kids, and he did a menorah lighting. So you know what? Who knows? And this young man came out with his daughter, ended up there, and nobody would have known that a life was actually in the balance that night. And now the two, the two had become reconnected through divine providence again. You think about the lights of Hanukkah, it means so much. The lights teach us so much. That and the Hasidic masters, many Hasidic masters have taught so much about what the lights say. Obviously, the Lubavitcher Rebbe and the, the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe, all the way from the Alter Rebbe, the Admar Azaken, whose holiday is today, um, talking about what the lights teach us, obviously, into, into other Hasidists, Rabbi Nachman of Breslev and the Noam Eli Melech and Levi Yitzhak of Berditcher. There's so much taught. Today, I'm going to focus a little bit on the source of what that light is and where the holiday of Hanukkah comes from. So, I'm going to start with... Um, just the, the background of where is Hanukkah from. It says in the, in the Gemara, in, in Tractate Shabbos, on page 21b, my Hanukkah, what is Hanukkah? And obviously goes on to explain to us the now very well-known story of Hanukkah. The Greeks, they came into, this, into the sanctuary, to the Heichal, and what did they go for? They didn't go for riches. They didn't go for gold and silver and precious stones. They went and they destroyed the oil. And we're going to come back to that a bit later. Why did they come to destroy the oil? And the Gemara explains all of that about why that all happened, and it says at the end of that little chapter, and thus the year after the sages instituted a holiday of praise and celebration, where we light the candles and commemorate the holiday of Hanukkah. So let's talk about the concept of the lights, the depth of what those mean, where they come from. There's two holidays on which we say the, the prayer of the al uh, the, about the miracles. There's Hanukkah <coughs> and Purim. And there's... Uh, you know, many differences between the two holidays, but there's one core difference, if anybody knows, but the core difference of the two holidays, on Purim, Haman and his evil plan was to destroy the Jewish people. Get rid of the Jewish people, no matter who, no matter where, we gotta get rid of these people. It was a battle against the human Jewish person, we need to eradicate that. That was Haman's plan. In, in Hanukkah, in essence, it was very different. The Greeks didn't have a problem with the Jewish person. They had a problem with the Jewish practice, the Judaism, if you will. The, the depth of it, the inner practice of Yiddishkeit was, was the problem that the Greeks had. <coughs> so in essence, it was a war on Judaism to destroy the Jewish religion, the Jewish practice, and Jewish custom. Um, they wanted to get to us at our core. And what is the core of the Jewish people? It's the practices that we do and if you look into Kabbalah and into Hasidic, into Hasidic teachings, uh, the Alter Rebbe talks about that same Tzedek in Darach Mitzvah it's the mitzvahs that we do that have no reason. It's, you know, obviously the, the Greeks, they you know, honor your parents and to, and to feed the poor. That all made sense. Do that. It's a great thing to do. But to uh, shatnas, don't mix wool and linen, um, and things like that, and ritual purities, and all these things which were much deeper and perhaps even with no, no uh, tangible reason that we could understand, that was something that really got to them. 
it really didn't make sense to them. Why does there have to be this underlying um, godly reason? Why can't you just do things rationally? Do, the, do things the rational way. So this war on holiness was the war on that underlying Jewish connection to the Creator, the Jewish people and God. To understand this, let's also understand that the, the Jewish people and the Greeks, there was a lot that they had in common. And the Greeks even, it's even went deeper to explain that the Greek people had, <coughs> had no problem with even Jewish holidays in some, in some cases because it was commemorating an event, a historical event that happened and it somewhat made sense and that was fine with them and some of the rituals that we had. But if you think about it, things a little bit deeper, the, the, um, the Alter Rebbe explains in Tanya that the Alter Rebbe explains in Tanya that um, even those that we know the reason, a mitzvah that we know the reason, let's just let's talk about honoring your parents or feeding the poor or whatever it is. Uh, we understand it makes sense. It's something that you should do. It's a nice thing to do. The Alter Rebbe explains that these are just reasons to make us feel like we know what's going on. The deeper <coughs> reason is really something that's beyond the grasp of our understanding. And the the Tzemach Tzedek, the the uh, third Lubavitcher Rebbe explains in, a, in his book, Derech Mitzvah Sefer, which explains different mitzvahs. He goes on for eight pages explaining the purpose and the reason of the mitzvah of Pru Uravu, to multiply, and to be fruitful, and to bring children into the world. And at the end of all of this explaining, the Tzemach Tzedek goes on to say <coughs> that really, in the mitzvah of Pru Uravu, the intent that you should have is that this was given to you by God and that this is godly and holy. That is the intent that anything else that you may know or any reason that we may have heard through Kabbalah or Drush, Remes, Pshat, Hasidus, wherever it may come from, those are just the surface and maybe not even that. And the Tzadok Tzadok stresses and in the mitzvahs that we do, even those with the reason, and the, when, the, when the Tzadok Tzadok explains all the mitzvahs in his book of Darth Mitzvah Secha, it's really at the end of the day, no matter what, this is because God gave it to us. And the Jewish people back then, and even throughout history, but this is what, what really got to the Greek people, was that even in the things that made sense, I do it because God told me to, because God said so. This is what my Creator wants me to do, and it, whatever it is, I do it, and that is holy because my Creator said that I should do it. When they saw this, and they saw that they couldn't get the Jewish people to break from that mentality, that's when the persecutions against the Jewish people began. Ultimately, that's when the war on Judaism, the war on holiness, began. So let's talk about why they went for the oil. We talked about the uh, why the story of Hanukkah came to be, uh, and and the and the um, the godly connection that the Jewish people have, um, and doing the mitzvah for a godly purpose, which is explained by many Hasidic masters. Let's talk about the oil. As we mentioned at the beginning, the, the, uh, the Greeks, when they came into the Hechal, into the sanctuary, they went for the oil. They didn't go for gold, silver, and stones, which there were plenty of, the riches, if you will. And when, and when the Hashmanaim, or the Hasmonians, or the Maccabees, if you, if, if you will, came into the Hechal after their unlikely and miraculous victory against the Greek people, they discovered that all the oil had been contaminated, had been rendered unholy and impure. And they needed oil to be able to light the menorah. They can't light the menorah with impure oil, so they had a, a problem on their hands in essence. What, what shall they do? And they searched and they searched and they searched and eventually they found one cruise of oil, one jug of oil that still had the stamp of the holy priest. And with that, they were able to light the candles. This is the miracle of the oil, the miracle of the lights. Obviously, we all know that that, that oil was enough to light to kindle the menorah for the one day. And the menorah lasted for eight days. If you all know, the, uh, in, in today's day and age, there's something called a charity campaign. Uh, Chabad Rechavia had a campaign just last week, I believe. You, you give us one dollar, it's matched into three dollars. You know, for one night of Hanukkah, we'll give you eight nights of Hanukkah. That was the original charity campaign. It was multiplied by eight for the miracle and for the purpose of lighting the menorah. And it wasn't even, by the way, if you know, the, the menorah in the Holy Temple, which we'll touch on a bit later as well, was only seven candles. The oil lasted for eight days. It was seven branches. Today's, today's is eight branches with the Shamash, it's nine. Um, and that was the miracle. So why the oil? What is the deeper meaning of the oil? Obviously, there's got to be something here. Kabbalah points to the idea of oil 
separating from other liquids, standing alone. Not only does it stand alone, but it rises to the top. If you think about the Jewish people, you know, Jewish people have often been standing alone, have often been rising to the top. But if you think about oil in Kabbalistic terms, oil is the embodiment of that aspect of the neshama, which we spoke about before, that relates to Hashem in the fashion that transcends intellect. This is exactly what the Greeks did not like. They did not like the fact that the Jewish people did things because God said so. This innate connection of the Jewish people to God, God said so, I do it. It's like as kids, you know, you can't play with that toy. Why? Because mommy said so. As a kid, that doesn't make sense. But as a Jew, because God said so, is the most sensible thing. As the inner neshama believes that godliness is holy and pure and just and right, everything we do in in the name of godliness is the right way and that is something that the that the greek people just could not just could not get along with it's the part of the soul that is drawn to akadosh baruch Hu, to god with or without rationale and the greeks were a very physical people very rational people they believed in the arts they believed in physical strength they believed in all of these things that everything had had a, had a reason had a rhyme had a way when it came to deeper meaning that wasn't really for them. And this is what it was about Hanukkah that told them this whole Jewish thing, if these people would just do it for real, normal reasons and do it in a way that we like, they'd be fine. But they can't. And they tried to get them to do it, and they couldn't. And the Jewish people stood strong and thus started, as we mentioned, the, the uh, war on holiness, the war on the Jewish people. The Greek people essentially said to them, learn Torah do mitzvahs, but do it as rational human beings. Don't do it as God said so. That makes no sense. When they said they couldn't do it, they went after the oil. Not only the oil, the physical jar of oil, they went after the soul. They went after the oil inside of each and every one of us. The oil that makes us who we are and that represents the depths of our relationship with Hashem. And that, to me, um, is definitely one of the the most important parts of Hanukkah, and when we think about the the oil and how the oil um, represents the Jewish people and the Jewish soul, you can think about the Jewish people throughout history. You can repeat this story in many different ways throughout history. And you can even repeat that story today here in our in our lives um, with out with outside forces like anti-Semitism and you know even forces from the inside within our own communities of people saying we don't have to publicly be as Jewish as this and we don't need to publicly do that. And if you are familiar with uh, the public menorahs in America that were, you know, let's, let's not flaunt our Judaism, let's not put it out there. And even within each and every one of us and how we live and how we, how we uh, practice and observe Judaism in our lives. Um, I know that where I come from, um, Judaism for many people is not that front the front end of their lives. It's something that they do at home, in the synagogue on the weekends, but it's not something that's part and central. It's obviously very different here in Israel, but in uh, in America, where I come from, especially in Virginia, that's how it works. And in each and every one of us, we have that inner battle of the Greeks against the Jews, and that battle against that, that, that jug of oil. And where do we find that jug of oil, and how do we relate to it? And for many of us, we like to justify how we practice and what we practice and really it's all justification that's inner inner battle between ourselves and our spiritual uh, light that is in all of us that we may not recognize that we may find that we're trying to to battle it and you know I want to push this to the side I want to work on my degree or on my job or that can all happen at the same time that inner light that pintle that 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 doesn't go out Sometimes it may be hard to find, it may be hard to recognize, it may be hard to realize that it's, that it's there, but that's something that each and every one of us, if, if we connect ourselves to the inner part of our soul, that's unbreakable, the unbreakable soul, if you will. And that is only deep on the inside. Well, we can connect to that every day. And we do that every day in our lives, whatever we practice, however we practice, we, 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 we tap into that inner soul. It's called the Yechida, it's, it's the innermost part of the soul that's connected to God. It's that part of the soul that gives us a yearning for godliness, for God, without reason. It doesn't need a reason. It's uncontaminated. It's, it's like that one cruise of oil in the Heichal, in the temple that was uncontaminated. That is the Yechid in each and every one of our souls.
And when we tap into that, we're able to do amazing things. We're able to go beyond the imagination. We're able to go into an infinite place. The, the Yechida represents infinite potential as the oil in the, in, in the eight days of Hanukkah represents infinite, infinite potential of the Jewish people, of the miracle, of godliness. And to explain that, if you think about the difference between Hanukkah um, today and the original story of Hanukkah, there are several differences that we could think of that I can, we can identify. There is the, the, uh, the menorah and the temple, as we mentioned, there's seven branches, the menorah today is eight branches, the menorah and the temple was lit um, indoors in the temple itself. And the menorah today we light outside to bring the holiday and the celebration to the people on the outside. And the holiday of, uh, of Hanukkah also is, is eight days long. It's not just seven days to commemorate those seven candles. There's an eighth day tacked on, obviously the miracle of the eight days. Why did that miracle take place over eight days? A lot of explanation goes into that. But one of the things that we can talk about that nature and reason are represented by seven because that's where the seven days of creation that's when God brought this physical world into existence and the physical world represents things that are you know routine and seven represents routine that eighth day brings us into that stage of miracle it brings us into that next step that that possibility the potential that we can all tap into if we go into the eighth day of our own soul the eighth day of the eighth the eighth dimension of what we can actually bring and what we can provide to the world. And today, um, as, as I mentioned today, the Hanukkah, when we come outside, we're bringing the, 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 the mitzvah of Hanukkah outdoors. If you, when you walked in here today, there's this big menorah, this big Hanukkah standing outside, and you'll see, starting next week on Sunday, as we're all familiar with, and all the windows and all the places, and especially Chabad Rechavia has like a dozen all over the, all over the neighborhood, and there's, there's Hanukkah everywhere in America, all over the world, you'll see, what is this whole idea of bringing the menorah, the Hanukkah, outside? Everyone lights one at home, but we're going beyond that. We're taking it beyond the home. We're taking it outside to bring the miracle, to spread the light. In the day and age, like today, when there's spiritual darkness, in essence, there's, there's like a, a Greek overlay of the Greeks of then that are, that are influencing this spiritual darkness in the world, which doesn't allow us to readily see that we can access our spiritual potential we can access godliness in a way that that we could do back then we could do it today just the same and by bringing those lights out into the world we're able to show people that we are proud we are jewish and we are celebrating these miracles actually uh, just in, in the in the torah portion we talked about we talked about yaakov uh, just last week and there's an interesting story there where yaakov it has an encounter with an angel on the other side of the Yabok River when he crosses back to collect his pachim k'tanim, the small containers that he had left over there, and he has this altercation with an angel, which is a very interesting story, a very interesting idea, uh, a fight with an angel, the whole question of why did Yaakov even cross over the river to get seemingly pachim k'tanim, something small, even the words that he used, like a small can, a couple of tins that he you know, could probably be replaced in the next town at the Makolet or whatever if there was such a thing. And he's, he's crossing back and he gets into this altercation where he ends up getting injured. And he asks the angel for a blessing. And the angel, you know, says, so what, what, is, what is your name? And he says, my name is Jacob, my name is Yaakov. And the angel says, your name will no longer be Yaakov. Your name will be changed to Yisrael. And the Rashbam explains on that, uh, not a Hasidic master, but predating, the Rashbam explains that when the angel was telling, telling Yaakov that your name will be Yisrael, it's not just a name change. It's not just, you know, Misrata Panim, check the boxes, change your name. It's a, a real serious change of the course of Jewish history until today that you can see in every generation. When Yaakov, when Yaakov was Yaakov, what was he named for? He was named for, he was holding on to the heel. He was second. He came out second. He was holding on. He was hiding. Something, he was a heel. He was using his heels to run. If you think about Yaakov's life, Yaakov ran away from his brother Esav. Now he's running away from his father-in-law. He's on the run. It was a person that just, he was kept running away from others. And the angel says to him, no, you are no longer going to have a life of running away. You are now going to have a life of Yisrael, which is a conjunction of two words, Yashar Kel. Be straight. Be straightforward and God will be with you. And that is the message. If you think about the Hanukkah lights, when you bring it out, 
here in Israel as well, in Eretz Yisrael, and also in America, and France, and Australia, and Canada, wherever, wherever the people are celebrating Hanukkah, and especially where you see the giant menorahs that are being displayed, that is bringing out the Jewish people and saying, Yashar Kel, Yashar, godliness, godliness is behind us, God is with us, we have faith, and we're going to be straightforward. We're going to we're going to jump out in front. We're going to be proud to be the Jewish people. We're not going to be the heel. We're not going to say, "Let me run from this. Let me let me hide from this. This is this is who I am, and I'm proud to be that person." And um, it's good when my notes go faster than I do, right? <laughs> um, so when you think also about about Hanukkah, I'm gonna I'm gonna end with this. Story. I know it's probably a little shorter than, than the rabbi wanted. I, th I think he told me 30 to 40 minutes, but I'm going to end with a couple of final thoughts. Um, today is the 20th of Kislev. Yesterday and today is a big Hasidic holiday. I'm sure we've discussed it plenty today. Uh, but I want to talk also about uh, the Alter Rebbe. The Alter Rebbe has a famous quote, which obviously around Hanukkah time is a very important quote, that a small bit of light can dispel a lot of darkness. And light doesn't always have to be a light switch or a candle or a flashlight. And the Alter Rebbe talks about this in Tanya, and the Rebbe talks about this in the Friedrich Rebbe, and there are many different um, discourses and, and talks to the, to, the, uh, to the community where that light can be so many different things. That light can be dispelling, excuse me, dispelling darkness in our own lives, can be dispelling darkness in our families, in our communities, and in the world. By the actions we take, that we can have an influence on somebody sometimes to a degree that we don't even know. Sometimes having an influence that we don't even know um, that that influence happened. There's a famous story of the two rabbinical students that went to a far out island uh, to find Jews and they found nobody. And they were walking around in the heat with their coats and their hats. And there's some guy in a hotel and he's looking down and he says, hey, look, some, look, there's rabbis. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. He's a Jewish guy in this island. He sees rabbis. And he didn't call the rabbis, but later on in his life, he bumped into some other Chabad rabbis, and he was much more religious, and he was much more practicing. He says, you know, i got to tell you my story. I was once living on this island, and there were these two rabbis. I saw them from the hotel. By the time I got that, I couldn't find them. I didn't see them. I had no idea where they were. They probably don't know this, but because I saw those rabbis, I was on this island, out of nowhere, but they found me. That the Jews were able to find me, that made me feel proud to be a Jew. And I decided that when I got back from the island, I became more involved and I became much more observant in my religious practice. In how we communicate with the people around us, in how we communicate with our spouses, with our children, with the people we work with, students that we teach, how we communicate with people, that is also um, a way to light a flame, to, a way to, to, to provide light, a way of always speaking in a positive. There have spoke many, many times. Uh, in, in, actually, the famous story when after the Rebbe had a heart attack, and the doctors said to him that if he continues to do uh, his practice like he's doing, which was he was still seeing some of the Hasidim and giving answers and talking, and the and the doctors said to him that if you continue like this, you know it's going to get worse, and you could uh, you could have a seventy percent chance of uh, of, uh, of not making it. And the Rebbe well, seemed like he was not listening. And the doctor says, excuse me, Rabbi, did you hear what I said? And the Rabbi says, yeah, you said that I have a, a very solid 30% chance of full survival. And that's the Rabbi. The Rabbi turned everything around into something positive. And if you look at the book of Tanya, it talks about how to see things in a positive light. It looks at it, it, how to, excuse me, how to, uh, how to practice your life in a positive way and share that positivity with others. L'chaim. and our interactions with the people around us, um, within our families, within the people uh, that we meet on the street, having the positive word, um, always having the benefit of the doubt, always remembering that if somebody is being obnoxious or rude to you, you have the opportunity to do something positive for them that can turn around their situation that can perhaps influence them to be more positive going forward. Um, I, that's that's my class. I'm happy to stand and answer some questions about that. And um, I guess the, the takeaways here from the Hasidic perspective, when we talk about Hanukkah, there are many different um, views and visions of Hanukkah. Obviously, we all like to celebrate Hanukkah in the home and <coughs> gifts. And there's actually another famous Hanukkah story of a, 
of a, a woman who was telling his son and daughter-in-law how to get to her new apartment. She had swooned to a new apartment, and she's explaining that you come to the building and you open the door with your elbow, and you walk inside, come to the elevator, you press the button to the elevator with your elbow, you get inside, you press the 14th floor with your elbow, you get inside the building on my floor, and you ring the bell with, the, with your elbow. And he says, Grandma, that seems pretty easy. And I'll open the door, ring the door, the elevator, well, why do I have to do this all with my elbow? And she says, what do you mean, you're coming empty-handed? <laughs> and it's, it's, obviously it's a joke, but if you think about it, Hanukkah is, is something that we all we celebrate with family. And that's also a way to share the light, to bring light to the world. And I think that when we all light our candles, and there's many resources on this very shelf behind me that you can read in, in all these different books that have different things about what are the candles saying to you. The Friedrich Rebbe, the previous Rebbe, said that every night when we light the candles, you should sit with the lights. You shouldn't just light them and run away. The only case you can light them and run away is if you're running out to help another light the candles. But ideally, sit with the candles and to learn and to listen. What are the candles telling you? What message of positivity, what message of light can you bring to the world and what can you learn from the holiday of Hanukkah? So I encourage everyone on every night to think about that one person that we could help that one person that we could teach, that one person that we could influence, and also how we can influence ourselves and bring the light more and more into our lives and into the lives of those around us. L'chaim, l'chaim, and I appreciate everybody uh, for being here. Good job to